Take your Bible, turn to Luke 12. If you didn't bring a Bible, uh, grab that one in the pew. Uh, Luke 12 is on page 60. In the New Testament, uh, if you're new to the Bible, that's uh, what we're all about. We love to look at God's Word. I was just looking this week at different titles for God's Word and uh, just saw one even as we were singing. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. It says in Isaiah when he said, you know, your sin left you stained, uh, but I'll wash you white as snow. We were singing that song, and I, I looked it up in Isaiah 1, and, and I saw the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Uh, but we're in Luke 12. I want you to take a look at it with me. We're walking through Jesus' life. It's what we do. If you're new, as again, we just uh, pick up where we left off last time. Uh, verses 22 through 34, uh, worry-free living. <laughs> Don't worry, Jesus said. Worry is futile. Worry is the opposite of faith. And worry is really thinking like somebody who doesn't know the Lord. I mean, if you don't know the Lord, you ought to worry. But if you know your Father, if you know God is your Father, you can live worry-free. And perhaps, um, you know, just to summarize what he said, in one sense, to talk about how free we can be of worry, look at the first verse, 22. He said to his disciples, For this reason I say to you, do not be anxious for your life as to what you shall eat, nor for your body as to what you shall put on. Don't worry about what you wear. <laughs> I mean, that, that's amazing. Now, today, our text starts by saying, worry about what you wear. <laughs> so, in one sense, verse 22 is for men, and verse 35 is for women. Don't no, worry about your wear. I like that verse. <laughs> worry about what you wear. Now, you say, did Jesus contradict himself? No, we're going to see. But look at verse 35. Be dressed in readiness. Uh, and the context, be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast. Boy, weddings. <laughs> You better worry about what you wear. I saw my wife in more dresses than I've seen in 20 years just trying them on. <laughs> and she wasn't even the bride. She was just the mother of the bride. You know, we've had a lot of weddings lately, and some of you guys can relate to this, and others will, or maybe you remember back. But we saw a lot of dresses, and, and even the same dress in different sizes, you know, getting ready. And then I didn't give much thought to what I wore. It's either the gray suit or the gray tux. I said, I, I own the suit. I'll go with that. My daughter overruled. And I, I forgot about it. I wore it, what, four hours? I forgot all about it till this week. When I went in to rent that thing, I, I tried it on. I went over to the window, or, you know, the mirror, looked, okay, fine. And then I got my card out, and the guy said, no, you already paid for it. I said, what? Oh, man, I was a happy man. I'll rent every time. I'm already paid for I came home. I said, hey, Chris, somebody paid for my tux. She said, don't you remember? You did. <laughs> no, I didn't remember. Up at the lake, they phoned you for your, remember the, oh, yeah, I had to dig my card out of my swim trunks and give them, you know, the card so it wasn't as exciting as I thought. And then this week... We're sitting at the breakfast table, and she's looking over the credit card bill. She said, boy, oh, yeah, you got tires for the car. Oh, yeah, we had a wedding. Oh, yeah, what's this? $177 for that tux. What? That's a racket. <laughs> I mean, I wore it four hours. Anyway, what am I talking about? <laughs> Don't worry about what you wear. No, worry about what you wear. Worry about what it costs. Uh, but actually, it's important what you wear to a wedding. And, and I 
wasn't upset as happy to get dressed up. It's a big occasion. And the Bible says the history is going to close with a wedding. And the joy of it, be dressed, he says, in readiness. Be like men who are waiting for the master to come from the bride, from the the wedding feast. So we're going to look at that. Let me just uh, give you just a little bit of uh, context because this is all one scene. And Jesus doesn't contradict himself in these things. It's woven together in the mind of Christ. And so we want to get it woven together in our mind as we listen to what he has to say. I remember he was talking about life and somebody interrupted him about inheritance and he talked about what life really is. He said, uh, verse 15, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed, for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. Life is not about how many bedrooms in your house or how many acres or what level you've hit in your career. That's not what life is about. Your possessions, how many cars you own or what kind of car you own, all that stuff. He says, in fact, and then he told this story, remember, and he, about the guy that's sometimes called the rich fool, but I call him the poor fool because he had all this stuff, but he was not rich, verse 21, toward God. He'd laid up a lot of treasure here on earth. <laughs> and he said, I'm fixed. I can take it easy. And God said, no, you fool, this very night your soul, your soul is required. We don't even believe in souls. When you're dead, you're just dead. Think again. I know our culture says stuff like that, but God says, don't be a fool. Think eternally. And then he said, and he launched into this, these thoughts on worry, not being fussing around about stuff like clothing and even food. God takes so care of us. Worry is futile. Worry is thinking like someone who doesn't know the Lord. But you know the Lord. And he said, remember who your father is, little children. If God is your father, you don't have to worry. Remember who your father is. Get rid of some stuff. He said, give your stuff. Sell your possessions and give it. Seek first. That's where we closed off. Verse 34. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Verse 31. Seek for his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Seek Christ first. Seek Christ last. Seek him everything in between. He's the Alpha and the Omega. Live for him. He'll take care of the rest. And when, when our Lord says, Seek me and my kingdom, he immediately... Notice, it's really not a change in subject, says, verse 35, be dressed in readiness and keep your lamps alight and be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast so that they may immediately open the door to him when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master shall find on the alert when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will gird himself to serve and have them recline at table and will come up and wait on them. Whether he comes in the second watch or even in the third and finds them so, blessed are those slaves. And be sure of this that if the head of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have allowed his house to be broken into. You too be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Readiness. Seek Christ in his kingdom, and when you do, you will be ready for his return. He's coming back. He's coming back. And uh, notice the language, verse 35, readiness. Verse 36, waiting. Verse 37, be on the alert. Be waiting for the master when he returns. Are you? What's occupied your mind and heart this week? Am I? 
Are we dressed in readiness? Are we clothed for action? I think the ESV has it. Because waiting, we will see in our text, waiting for the Lord always leads to doing, living. Uh, As you think, so will you be. And if you're thinking about the Lord's return, it changes the way you think and changes the way you act and live. The New Testament calls us to trust in Him for daily life, like He just said, and to wait for Him daily. (laughs) Daily. Uh, There's no contradiction here at all. Uh, He wants us to be awaiting His return. I remember the very first sermon I preached here. I guess I preached when they were thinking about, you know, having me come. I flew in for the weekend, but I remember back to the first sermon I preached, and it was out of Thessalonians chapter 1, and uh, Paul said to the Thessalonians, he said, man, you Thessalonians, he said, I remember, I've seen how you turned to God from idols to serve the living God and to wait for his Son from heaven. And it was my very first sermon, and it had three points. I haven't preached one since. (laughs) Turn to God. Serve him and wait for his son. Right in the text, 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10. And that is a great three-point outline, by the way, of of the Christian life. You turn to God, you serve him, and you wait for his return. We make it so complicated. Uh, Jesus said, listen, don't let your heart be troubled. I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And I'm not just saying these things. (laughs) If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. The guys were standing there when Jesus left like this. Remember Acts verse chapter 1? And the angel said, what are you standing here for? This Jesus whom you saw leave is coming in the same way you saw him go. <laughs> that kind of summarizes everything. Acts 1.11. He left, he's coming back. And you and I are to be dressed in readiness. I love, uh, I just love the appropriateness of the Bible, you know? I mean, I tell people all the time, I tell you today, this is the Word of God. When you read it, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And it begins with majesty. Majesty. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's kind of where I'd expect it to start, if God's going to tell us something. And he did. And it closes. Genesis 1 all the way to Revelation 22. And it closes with the Lord Jesus Christ saying, I am coming quickly. I am coming quickly. I am coming quickly. Three times he says it. And the heart led by the Spirit says, Amen. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. (laughs) That's so appropriate. By the way, I just, this kind of comes through my mind. I've been, you know, teaching John downtown And John, you see these great I am statements of Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection and the life. And we had a great time in John, and now we're into Colossians. And Colossians responds. Colossians, little letter Paul wrote, it answers. He is. He is. He is. 
And just seeing how those two books tie together has been a blessing to me and I hope to those whom I'm teaching. But, you know, he says, I am, and the Bible says he is. <laughs> he is. Everything he said. And I was thinking about it this way. Jesus said, I'm coming. I'm going to go prepare a place, and I'll be back. I'm coming. And the epistles say, he is. <laughs> he is coming. And Revelation closes with the Lord speaking again, I am coming quickly. I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Now notice, he says, be dressed in readiness. Keep your lamps alight. Be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast so that they may immediately open the door to him when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master shall find on the alert when he comes. Blessed. By the way, uh, when we were in Luke 6, and Jesus said, blessed are those who, we called it the Beatitudes of Luke. We usually think of the Beatitudes over in Matthew, but uh, Luke records them for us. And you know what? Blessed, look at verse 37. Blessed are those slaves whom the master shall find on the alert when he comes. Verse 38, whether he comes to the second watch or even in the third watch and finds them so, blessed are those slaves. You know, let me tell you something. Verse 43, blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Three times. I think we can call this the beatitude of Luke. You want a blessing? You want to be happy? You know, the first psalm starts, blessed is the man. Blessed is the woman. Blessed is the boy. Blessed is the girl. Blessed is the one. Who doesn't stand in the path of sinners nor sit in the seat of scoffers? But his delight is in the law of the Lord. That's how the songbook starts this blessing on those who listen to God's word and meditate in it. And whenever God says, blessed are, we ought to listen up. And here, three times, he says, I'll tell you who's blessed. The one who's waiting, ready, dressed in readiness, eagerly awaiting. That's what Philippians says. He's going to, our citizenship isn't here, Philippians 3.20. Our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly await a Savior who will transform this body of humility, this humble body, into conformity with the body of his glory. Blessed are those who are waiting. And notice, I mean, I wouldn't put it this way. In fact, as I looked at this, it shocked me. Look at verse 37. Blessed are those slaves whom the master shall find on the alert when he comes. Truly I say to you that he, the master, will gird himself to serve and have them recline at table and will come up and wait on them. We were just, I was just talking with, at, when we greeted one another, uh, Ryan said, man, I, this fall, I love fall, I love fall food, you know, and so do I. You know, uh, you'd like to sit down to a meal. I love summer food. I love winter food. I love it all. But, but we were talking about hot food instead of these salads, you know, getting some real fall food. <laughs> right, right? He's, and, uh, but anyway, you, don't you love to sit down to a meal and the fellowship? And some of the best times, one of the reasons we have such good times in the evenings, both outdoor and in, is that we eat together. We fellowship together. And that's the picture the wedding feast. We're going to sit down and eat. And notice, amazingly, the master is going to serve us. If, if we're thinking clearly, we'll be blown away when we see Jesus get up after the supper and gird himself and wash feet. And the disciples, they couldn't believe it. You know, and Peter said, you wash my feet? No, no way. 
It just, it just didn't process. It's an amazing thing that the God of the universe, the Lord of lords and King of kings, is going to serve his own in the kingdom. That's who God is, by the way. If you're here not knowing him, I'm glad you're here, and I welcome you. And some of the conceptions you have about him are no doubt wrong. Some of them might be right. I'm just telling you that the way we really know about him is he told us about himself, and he said he's the kind of God that will serve us. It's amazing to pause and ponder that. What a picture of that glorious reception. I mean, you know, it's fun to sit down. I, we've had, what, three in the last three weeks and probably some more coming, these weddings. And it's always fun afterwards to just enjoy the food and the fellowship. Well, this is, what, uh, this is what's awaiting us. The Lord's return is a blessed thing for those who are ready. For those who are ready. Verse 38, whether he comes in the second watch or even in the third and finds them so... Blessed are those slaves, even if he takes a long time. Even if it seems like, ah, they've been saying that for a long time, there's blessing. Now, he's going to change gears, verse 39. Be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have allowed his house to be broken into. He's going to change the metaphor. And so, obviously, whenever I speak of the second coming of Christ, the return of Jesus... It brings comfort and hope to believers who are ready. And it brings terror and uncomfortableness and skepticism and anything to try to avoid to those who aren't ready. And you're either one or the other. And maybe you're feeling a mixture because Christians who've been living as if what you put on is the most important, what you eat, your retirement account, living for here and now, we're not ready. Even if we know the Lord. Even if we've been cleansed, if we've been caught up in fussing around and worrying about this life, we're really not ready. And so it could be that you're feeling both. And I want to redirect your attention this morning, like Jesus did, to his return. It, uh, it might be a long time. The Lord's return, we don't know when. Look at verse 38. could be the third, second watch, or even... The third, second watch of their night, that'd be like saying 9 p.m. to midnight. Could be late night. Or it could be third watch, midnight to 3 o'clock. Whenever he comes, even if he's long delayed, be ready. When I was nine years old, I, uh, we'd been playing ball for years. We had this vacant lot. We played, you know, ball. But I had my glove and everything. When I was nine, Biff Nelson played catch with me. Now, I know that almost sounds like I made the name up, but it's true. And he was four years older than me. And I was out there playing catch with Biff. And I was loving it. And he introduced me. He had a new glove. And I think that's why he was playing catch with this kid four years younger than him, because he wanted to break it in. But he showed me his new glove, and he let me wear it. And it was a Willie Mays glove. And then he introduced me to the whole world. I didn't even know it existed of big league baseball and Mays and the Giants, you know. And that was the summer of 62. And summer of 62, they made it. They, they ended the season in a dead heat with the Dodgers, the hated Dodgers. I had to say that because one of our elders doesn't want me to mention the Dodgers from the pulpit unless I add the adjective. But I don't let Sam push me around. <laughs> but anyway, they ended in a dead heat, and there was a three-game playoff, and the Giants won. I was sitting in the dentist chair, I still remember, and they had it on the radio, and I was so excited. And then they played in the World Series against the Yankees, and it was Mays against Mantle, and, you know, the whole thing. And I thought that's the way it was every year. And so I adopted the Giants, and they were my team. And 27 years later was the first time they ever got there. 89. Long delayed. <laughs> Long delayed. But I'll tell you what, I was waiting anxiously for 27 years. And when they got in the World Series, I remember gathered the whole family, and by now I had four kids. 
And we got this old TV, and I think I brought home a VCR from the church because we didn't have one. And so I plugged it all in. We had it sitting on the fireplace, and we get ready for the World Series. And uh, it was a long-anticipated, a long-anticipated time, but I continued to be eagerly awaiting. Be ready. You see, with the Lord, Second Peter says, ah, oh, they've been saying that for a long time. Mockers will say that. In fact, maybe you've been saying that. Uh, Christians have been. I remember when we were younger, there was a lot of talk about that, but now, you know, it doesn't seem to be. Yeah, I know. And that's a problem. The church is lethargic. Christians aren't eagerly anticipating. Maybe you are indulging in the Second Peter 3 language. Yeah, well, you know, they, we said that when... I remember when all those songs about his return and stuff. But, hey, you know, yeah, life goes on, and you get used to it. Listen, Peter responds, with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. It's been a couple thousand years. Yeah, two days, a couple of days, a couple of watches in the night. Um, be ready. A thousand years is as a watch in the night, this psalm says. So uh, stay ready. Be dressed in readiness. Now he changes metaphors, as I said. Be sure of this, verse 39, that if the head of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, now it's no longer a joyous, blessed wedding feast. He's talking about a thief in the night. If the head of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have allowed his house to be broken into. Is this just one time when Jesus slipped up and used a different metaphor? Uh-uh. No, this is so common through the New Testament. First Thessalonians, that book that I first preached. In fact, I started, the, I started that first sermon. I started in verse 9, and then I said, I'm going to preach this whole book. And so we went back and we went through Thessalonians. You get to chapter 5. And it says, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they're saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like birth pangs upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Are you ready? A thief in the night. Peter, Paul said that in Thessalonians. Peter says in that third chapter, addressing the scoffers, the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Revelation, the last book of the Bible, the risen Christ says to the church at Sardis, wake up, wake up, repent. Repent. If therefore you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come upon you. Chapter 16, the statement is made universally. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his garments, lest he walk about naked and men see his shame. Oh, be careful how you dress. Be worried about what you dress like, how you dress. I'm coming like a thief in the night. Always the point is the unexpected nature. Be ready at all times. Oh, they said that in the second watch. Yeah? Could be the second watch. Could be the third watch. But when he comes... There will be no escape for those not ready. You too, notice verse 40, be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Boy, we turned that television on, had the VCR all hooked up at the fireplace, and I remember the pregame show of the third game. You know, they lost the first two. I didn't like to remember those. But uh, third game, you know, San Francisco, Oakland, the 
BART series, the Bay series. You know, it was big stuff. And Al Michaels and Tim McCarver were talking and reviewing the first two games and then saying what the Giants needed to do. And I was just soaking it all in. And all of a sudden, the, the, the screen just went bad. And I thought, this crazy old TV, you know. And I lost. And then Al Michaels came back on, but just not his face, just his voice. And he said, whoa. He said, we had an earthquake. And he said, we didn't, I don't even know if I'm... I don't even know if I'm on the air, and I don't know if I care. <laughs> and then he, you know, and, then he, they, and somebody said, no, we can hear you, but they still no picture, and it was just all of a sudden. And he said, well, we're going to, I guess we're going to cut away. Somebody must have told him, we're going to cut away. There was chaos in Candlestick Park, chaos throughout the whole Bay Area, San Francisco. And all of a sudden, he said, well, well, we'll, we'll be back. We're going to cut away. We'll be back, we hope. And he said it not like, I sure hope we can put our act together. He said, we hope, like, I hope I'll be back. He'd felt old Candlestick Park shake, and there was panic. You could hear it in the crowd behind him. And when they came back, it wasn't about baseball. The devastation. The Bay Bridge collapsed. That long section, just like a pancake. There was fire in San Francisco, and all of a sudden, everybody thought differently about what was really important. And Al Michaels became like the news anchor from Candlestick. And you remember it, some of you talking about what was going on and the loss of life and the carnage, and everybody's attention was changed. A couple days later, they found out the epicenter was 60 miles south in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And they interviewed a guy, and I wrote it down. Because he stood there, he had seen the earth just open. And they showed the big crack in the earth just and the deepness of it. And he stood there and he said, it happened, it all happened so fast. It all happened so fast. I've never seen it happen before. I've heard it doesn't happen, but I watched it happen. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I've heard that. You Christians talk about that stuff. I've never seen that kind of thing. It happened so fast. I've heard it doesn't happen, but I saw it happen. And, of course, San Francisco repented just like New York did, just like New Orleans did. And by the way, when I say that, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying some especially awful city got judged. I'm saying these things are to wake us all up, but they don't. I remember when we gathered in here on 9-11, and I remember the community mood, and you do too, some of you. But we, we learn to live with it. We move on. Every one of these is a precursor to the time when he will return like a thief in the night, and they will not escape. I don't know how he could put it any stronger. Verse 40, you too be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Many millions today are more concerned about their alarm system at their house than they are being ready for the thief in the night. Many are more concerned about their cars, their clothes, their house, their health care than their eternal soul. You fool, Jesus said about 10 minutes ago in the text here. This very night, your soul is required of you. You know, many professing Christians are more ready for their next vacation than they are for the Lord's return. Maybe you. More ready for, uh, you've given more thought to and got your ducks in a row <laughs> for your retirement more than what really counts. Some of you are more cognizant of the next sale at the mall than the sure return of Jesus Christ. As I say, 
Blessed are those who are waiting, who are ready. You know, the Bible uses two metaphors in this wedding feast. Remember Jesus told the story in Matthew 22 about the wedding, and the guy slips in, and he's not dressed in wedding clothes? <laughs> and he says, friend, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? And the guy is sp speechless. No answer. I believe he's referring, you can read it, Matthew 22. Don't think that you can just slip into the wedding feast unless you are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. If you're clothed in the filthy garments of your sin, and you look pretty good to the church, maybe you look pretty good to people in the world, but God sees right through all that, and he's already said what you're wearing, filthy garments, your own righteousness. If you're trusting in anything or anyone other than Jesus Christ, you're not dressed right. You're not ready. And Matthew 22 says it very sobering, very solemn. How did you get in here? And the guy's speechless. And he says, get him out of here. Put him out with the weeping and the gnashing of teeth. If words mean anything, and they do, and Jesus' words mean everything, I plead with you to listen to him speak about the wedding feast. And then he speaks to us, all of us who know him. You say, Scott, I've put my faith in Christ. I'm glad, I'm so glad you have. He's coming back. Seek his kingdom, and he'll take care of everything else. Put your treasure in heaven, not here on earth. Be ready. Be dressed in readiness so that when somebody says, what did she wear? You can just say, well, it was, you know, because you saw. About all I knew about the wedding, when my, when my wife was trying on all those dresses, she said, remember what I wore at Katie's wedding? I said, what? <laughs> I know the, the bride wore white at every one of them. That's about all I remembered. But some of you are a little more uh, observant than me. And when you dress a certain way, people can see it. What's he got on? What's she wearing? Can people see in your life a readiness for the Lord's coming? Be dressed in readiness. Well, now, Scott, who's he talking to here? I mean, are you pre-trib or post-trib? I mean, there's premillennialism. Yeah, it's all so complicated. Look at verse 41. Peter said, Lord, are you addressing this parable to us or to everyone else as well? I am so glad that Peter spoke up at this point because there are some of you I know who are thinking, well, is he talking about the second coming or the rapture? I don't know if we need to really too worry too much about this. Are you addressing this to us or to everyone else as well? And interestingly and instructively, the Lord doesn't answer him. He just tells some more thoughts about readiness. Is this for the church or is this for Israel? Is this for us or everyone else? The Lord said, who is the faithful and sensible steward whom his master will put in charge of his servants to give them their rations at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. He says, be wise, be prudent, be sensible, be ready. And when you're ready, you will be seeing it how? Well, look at verse 43. His master will find him so talking, uh-uh, so thinking, uh-uh, so doing, doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he'll put him in charge of all his possessions, and uh, I'm getting in next week's sermon, so we'll just leave it right there, and I ask you, are you ready? Well, is this for me? Yes, it's for you. It's for all of us. I say to you, I say to all, Jesus said. Be ready. Be ready. Be dressed in readiness. Oh, Christian, when the one who died for you comes again, he's going to serve you. You're going to have fellowship with him. Why in the world do we fuss around about this world in the sense of let it be our priority when we've got all eternity to enjoy him and his fellowship and the meals and anyone 
who is not clothed in the righteousness of Christ. I don't care what you've got here and now. Remember what it says in Revelation 16? Let me reread it to you. Behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his garments, lest he walk about naked and men see his shame. Only thing that'll count when suddenly it all happens so fast, the Lord closes history out. Only thing that'll matter is your relationship or lack thereof with Jesus Christ. Father.